I'm Josh Canales, pastor of the Great Mission Ebenezer Family Church. Tonight, we are going to be reading out of the book of Proverbs, chapter 12. I'd like to read a few verses from this chapter. We'd like to go to the Lord in prayer and then unpack this passage. And tonight, we are going to be talking about discipline. Discipline, discipline, discipline. A word that not many of us very much like or appreciate but understand that it is necessary. It's one of those necessary things that we all have to apply to our lives. Proverbs chapter 12. Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but the Lord, but he who hates correction is stupid. A good man obtains favor from the Lord, but the Lord condemns a crafty, man or a man who schemes. A man cannot be established through wickedness, but righteousness can be uprooted. Cannot be uprooted. A wife of noble character is her husband's crown, but a disgraceful wife is like decay in his bones. The plans of the righteous are just, but the advice of the wicked is deceitful. The words of the wicked lie in wait for blood, but the speech of the upright rescues him. Wicked men are overthrown and are no more, but the house of the righteous stands firm. A man is praised according to his wisdom, but men with warped minds are despised. Three more verses. Better to be a nobody and yet have a servant than pretend to be a somebody and have no food. Mm-mm-mm. A righteous man cares for the needs of his animal, but the kindest of acts of the wicked are cruel. And finally, verse 11, he who works his land will have abundant food, but he who chases fantasies lacks judgment. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We lift up the prayer requests that were presented before all of us today, Father, from health to wisdom to finances. Father, we pray for uh, parents and family members who are caring for children, Father, who are at home right now. We lift up all the children who have been set back because of the inability to receive um, the education that they need and um, the way that it's impacting and affecting all of our children. Father, we lift up all of those who um, have needs, Father, family members who don't know Jesus, friends who have not yet come to Christ. Lord, we lift up those needs right now. Father, we pray that you would meet each person right now, Father God, wherever they may be. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would intervene, Father God, um, on our behalf and go into all of these places, Father, wherever these individuals are, Father, that we're lifting up to you. Those who are joining us right now in the Spirit, those who are praying in the Spirit right now, Father, I pray that the Holy Spirit would join with us as we link arms with you, Father God, in doing your great work. We pray all these things in Christ's name. And the people of God said, Amen, Amen, Amen. Praise God. So we are going to dive into the book of Proverbs today, but we're going to focus on verse one, if that's okay, because there's a whole lot that is spoken about right here in Proverbs chapter one. Oh, I, I do have to mention, and I'll come back to it later if I, if I remember, uh, the Latin American Bible Institute is having a Zoom video conference this Saturday for anybody who is interested in starting Bible college for the very first time. I would like to say congratulations to Dr. Marty Harris and the Latin American Bible Institute or Lobby College who just received their national accreditation as a college slash university. So our little small Bible college that educated my grandparents back in the 40s and provided Bible uh, college diploma uh, to begin in ministry has now become an accredited university and college right here in the good old U.S. of A. And there is tremendous financial aid, tremendous um, opportunity for those of you who are interested in beginning Bible courses, whether on the physical campus or plant there in La Puente, California, 
or by taking your classes online, which may be the best method and measure for you this year. If you are interested, um, I was asked by the Dean of Students and the pastor um, of the campus there, Ruben Mora, to make sure to get the information to you if you're interested. They'd like to give you the video Zoom um, ID and um, information so you can join the administration of LABI College this Saturday evening if you're interested in Bible College. All right, that does it. So here we go. Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge. All right, um, I want to first begin by reminding us that the root word for um, our our namesake as Christian or disciple um, is discipline. It comes from the same root word, and the the, he, the Greek word for uh, disciple is mathetes. It's a learner. It's one who is in a posture of learning. In other words, one who is a disciple is a student. One who is a disciple is in a position to be taught, instructed, um, to be poured into, and also disciplined if, in fact, discipline is necessary. We all know that we need to discipline ourselves, and that's something that God calls each and every one of us to. But at the same time, it's not just discipline that we have to impose upon ourselves, but it's also discipline from the Lord. Jesus, in fact, loves you so much. He loves me so much that he has chosen to teach me his ways. He has chosen to teach you his ways. So he has to teach us through discipline. That's how much he loves us. You can ask any child. No child ever wants to be disciplined. No child ever wants to be corrected. I'm a grown man and I do not like to be corrected. I do not like to be disciplined. There's a uh, the word <coughs> in the King James Version in the book of Hebrews for discipline is chastisement. Or to chastise one, to discipline one, means that they are loved. Because one who is disciplined is a person, in fact, who is considered a son of or daughter. What's up, Big J? My boy Jason Repko uh, joining us, one of my former teammates with the Los Angeles Dodgers. Good to see you, brother, all the way up there from Washington. Tonight, we are learning about discipline. You want to know how much discipline it required for an athlete, a young athlete who is trying to make the big leagues or just get drafted or experience success? It means that athlete has to discipline themselves when nobody is around. When, when there's nobody to go to the batting cages with, that individual's got to go and train. When a football player wants to play at high levels in high school, college, or the NFL, they have to train when nobody's looking. They have to train when everybody's asleep. They have to beat their body. They have to discipline themselves, including their eating habits. That's one of the things we're working on right now with our, our uh, soon-to-be high school son, is how to train his body, how to feed his body to eat the right foods so that he can be in the best possible shape that he can be. Tonight, we're talking about discipline. Nobody likes discipline. And that's why most parents, they ship off their kids to boarding schools when they're not falling in line or wanting to do what mom or dad say. They don't wanna obey the house rules anymore. Fine, you can go and figure it out on your own. You're in need of much discipline. How many of, of you out there went into the military because you saw a wonderful opportunity to learn something and to um, help discipline or bring discipline into your life in order to give you the foundation that was needed to become the successful person that you are today? It was a part of God's plan to place you there, whether you're um, a, a foot soldier, whether you're a Marine, whether you're a part of Air Force, whether you're Navy, you name it, um, whatever the case may be, maybe you're a part of the Airborne, um, <clears throat> discipline is required in the life of a successful individual. And I tell you what, God wants 
all of us to be successful. God wants all of us to experience his favor. But God just doesn't open up heaven and pour on favor just upon anybody. No, he wants to see who is exercising discipline in their life. Proverbs chapter 12 says, whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but he who hates correction is stupid. All right. So, hey, uh, you guys turn with me, please, to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. We're going to read verses uh, four through nine. Are you there? Okay, I'm going to put my pen right here in Proverbs to keep my place. If you have Hebrews chapter 12, verses four and following, would you follow along with me? I see uh, Gilbert Perez, United States Navy. Uh, Sister Elizabeth Hernandez and Brother Sergio, your son is uh, serving in the armed forces right now. And I'm sure he's going to appreciate much of the discipline that he is gaining and learning right now. And we'll apply that into civilian life very soon and continue to be the success that you and Sergio um, have contributed in his life. God bless you. Uh, verse four, Hebrews chapter 12, everybody in your struggle. The author says, against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And you have forgotten that the word of encouragement that addresses you as sons. I want you to focus on the word sons, huiu, the Greek word huiu, sons. He says, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you. Okay, so discipline comes from God. It comes from the Lord. Because the Lord disciplines those that he loves and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son or daughter or child. Okay, we need to understand that right there. We, all, we also can read in Proverbs chapter three that that discipline or that correction um, from the Lord comes as a result of love that God has for his children. Let's continue and then we'll come back to these verses. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? If you're not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons. An illegitimate child or one who is not cared for or one who is neglected is one who is not disciplined, one who is not treated as a true son or a true daughter. How many of us know that to be true, know that to be the case? Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respect them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of our spirits and live? Our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they bought, as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. Let me read that again. Our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best. 18 years to be exact. After that, boom, children are on their own. But God disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. In other words, that means that the, the role or responsibility that, that, that parents have is just for a short while, knowing that the parenting continues even into adulthood for the children. However, the true discipline that continues forever is the discipline that comes from Father God, from Abba Father, one who Jesus often referred to as Abba or Daddy. Verse 11, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. And later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. So if we come back here to Hebrews chapter 12, beginning in verse 4, we see that um, the author to the Hebrews is wanting to establish a precedent 
for the significance or the importance of discipline. He says, in your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And you have forgotten that the word of encouragement that addresses you as sons. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you. Stop there for a moment. Rebuke is something that must be done in love. Otherwise, if rebuke comes as a result of anger, if rebuke comes as a result of frustration, if rebuke comes from a result of impatience, if rebuke comes from being short-tempered, if rebuke comes from um, a, a fleshly or carnal place, then a rebuke oftentimes is not only rejected, but it is not being supplemented or complemented with the necessary love, nurturing, and grace and mercy that needs to come alongside true discipline, true rebuke. Whenever God rebukes any of us, God desires to do it in a loving way. But how many of you know that some of us are stubborn? Some of us are hard-headed. And um, we have to be taught oftentimes, um, time and time again. And it's a, it's repetition that, that God has to use in our lives in order to bring us to a place of surrendering the very things or areas of our life that God is requiring discipline. The, the author of Hebrews says, my son, or the Proverbs in chapter three, my son. Here we read in Proverbs chapter 12 about the discipline that is required um, for those who desire knowledge. Now, how many of you desire knowledge? How many of you desire wisdom? How many of you desire discipline? All right. It's a gift from God. All right. Um, they always called me an overachiever in my my career in sports because I was able to um, achieve a little bit of success um, and was oftentimes never measuring up to some of the pure or raw potential um, of athletes that I competed against. But you know what? It was because of the discipline and the hard work that my father and mother ingrained in me at a young age that helped me and my brothers um, achieve any kind of success that we had. Uh, <clears throat> I learned to have a very, very uh, good work ethic at a young age. My father, who was never able to play um, any organized sports growing up, um, he couldn't teach us how to throw a baseball. He couldn't teach us how to hit. Couldn't teach us how to throw the football or kick a soccer ball. My dad never played basketball in an organized way. Neither did my mom. But there was one thing that my father taught me and my brothers. Um, and I'm the eldest of three boys. He said, work harder than everybody around you. And hustle, hustle, hustle. That was what my father taught us. And so at, a, at an early age, we learned how to discipline ourselves and apply all of those principles and truths into our lives. And it helped a whole lot. I tell you that for a fact. Um, so look at what it says here. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you. All right. So let's let's pause there for a moment and let's think about um, this kind of discipline or rebuke, okay? In the English translation, we see the word discipline, rebuke, and punish, or correction all in the same breath. These are words that are used interchangeably in this text and also used repetitiously in the Proverbs. We see that discipline, rebuke, correction, and Punishment all come together. But let's think about these things for a moment. In terms of discipline, all right? Does discipline need to be too harsh or does discipline need to simply 
achieve a desired outcome. Think about that for a moment. Does discipline need to exceed or carry with it an overbearing harshness or does it need to have with it uh, within the confines of, of wisdom and understanding also the end result in mind? What will this discipline bring about as a result of the discipline that is being brought to the individual? I think that is very significant for us as Christians Maybe for some of us who are parents, maybe some of you are at home right now and are struggling through disciplining your children, especially when you guys are all in close quarters for these last six weeks. I mean, think about that for a moment. My wife and I have had to have uh, a couple of powwows with our kids over the last couple of weeks and discuss with them um, the kind of discipline, correction, punishment, or rebuke that they would need in order to bring about uh, our desired outcome for their lives. And I'm not going to put them on blast right now. You may have been wondering to yourself, what did I mean when I said powwow? Um, well, it's when me or Boomy uh, powed and our kids wowed. Um, that's what a powwow is, a good old-fashioned powwow is um, uh, a little spanking on the rear, spanking on the backside for those who are in need. Uh, not too much, not heavy handed, but just enough to bring about the desired outcome for our children. Now, one of the things that I learned from my parents, and this is very important for us who are contemplating discipline, is this. When we discipline our children, when we bring correction to our children, it's very important that it doesn't just end at punishment, okay? Punishment is only a, 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 a small, it's a very small, minuscule uh, percentage of the overall behavioral changes that we are bringing up in our children. The punishment is very small, it's very swift, Okay, and it is done and over with. And you have to be very intentional about how you discipline. We have to be very intentional about how we bring our children into the process of discipline whenever we want to see an achieved outcome. Most of the time, it's a quick correction, but it's followed with lots of love, lots of hugs, lots of kisses, lots of talking, and in, in most cases, if, if we spent an hour with any one of our children because of um, an infraction, because of them getting out of line, guess what? Their discipline, their punishment is going to be within uh, 30 seconds to five minutes, okay? Let the punishment fit the crime, all right? Let's not be overbearing. Let's not, let's not antagonize our children. Let's not push our children to the place of resentment. Or, or rebelliousness towards us. No, that's not a good or healthy thing. Those of us that also have preteens, we also have to contemplate how we discipline our children. I mean, my 11-year-old son, my 13-year-old son, they're not getting many spankings anymore. My 13-year-old hasn't gotten a spanking in probably five, six years. Our 11-year-old probably hasn't had a spanking in probably two years, I would say. But the most significant part of our, our rearing or our discipline, all right, um, knowing that we, didn't, we never spared the rod um, with our children, is this, is that the love, is that the words of correction, the words of affection, and the words of affirmation come swiftly thereafter, right after a, a correction, right after a spanking, right after a, um, our three-year-old daughter who is pushing those boundary. She's pushing the envelope. As cute as she is, oh, you look at that little sweet thing and, and don't nobody want to make her cry. But guess what? She needs to understand our Lola. 20-year-olds, <laughs> you're funny, Elizabeth. Our three-year-old, <coughs> we don't want to see uh, those tears well up in her eyes. But guess what? She needs it. We don't want to be willing parties to her grave. That's what the word of God says, that 
a man or a woman are willing parties to the grave of their children should they spare the rod. And what does that mean to spare the rod? It means that there is no discipline. It means there is no correction. It means that for whatever reason, we don't intervene or interact with our children to bring about the desired outcome or behavioral changes that are necessary for their lives in order for them to be successful. And it's very important that we as Christians implement discipline and correction in our children's lives. That's why it's here in the word of God in Proverbs and in the book of Hebrews. It says, those whom God loves, he disciplines. Those whom God loves, he chastises. Those whom God loves, he considers his sons, his daughters. I mean, this is some real stuff right here. If we don't correct our children, then guess what? We are willing parties to their grave. Why? Because we're not setting them up for success. And it's because we are not preparing to move them to the edge of the nest and bringing them to the point where they, they spread their wings, having the necessary tools and resources in their belt, in their lives, in their hearts, to bring them to a place of managing and properly being equipped for this world. Because this world is a dog-eat-dog world. This world ain't waiting for nobody. This world is so competitive. And we live in the United States of America, a capitalistic society. At least I thought um, last time I checked. Um, it hasn't been so much lately. Everything is shut down. But let me not get off topic. That's probably for another lesson. Check it out. Our children need to know and need to understand what discipline um, means and what it looks like. And guess what? That's what God also is demonstrating for his church. Yes, that's why I went on that whole rant about why we as parents have to discipline our children. It's to bring about the point, and I was getting a whole lot of amens on the comments I saw there down below. But guess what? It's all to bring about the point. That's exactly how God has to work with us. Punishment is swift, but Affection, affirmation, restoration is so much longer and it's so much more important in the process of bringing about behavioral changes in our lives. And it's all because God loves us. It's all because he wants us to grow. He doesn't want us to stay stuck on stupid. All right. Verse one says, he who does not love correction is stupid. God don't want us to stay stuck on stupid. All right. He doesn't. He wants us to grow. And if and if we are not at at where we we need to be, then guess what? He's going to bring us along incrementally, step by step to new levels in life where more discipline, more hardship, more correction, more rebuke is on the way. <laughs> Can any of you say amen? You're like, nah, pastor, I ain't saying amen to that. All right, well, why not? Why not welcome discipline? Why not welcome rebuke? Why not welcome correction? Are you 65 years old? Why not welcome the rod of discipline from the Lord in your life if you need it? Why not welcome um, the, the, the rod of correction from God for our spiritual backside if in fact we're being lazy spiritually, if we are not growing in our marriages, if we're being stubborn and not loving our spouses the way we need to love them, if we are not growing at work and expanding our horizon trying to um, be better equipped with higher aptitudes in whatever area of learning that we are, we are trying to go after, we have to continue to welcome correction, discipline, rebuke, and what is it? Instruction from the Lord. Look what it says here in James chapter one. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance and perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything, mature 
and complete, not lacking anything. That's why God allows trials and tribulations to still be a part of the life of the believer. I just read from James chapter one, verses two through four, and it's no wonder why it is a whole two chapters from Hebrews chapter 12, where we um, are reading from, coupled with Proverbs chapter 12, verse one. God enables us to endure hardship. Scripture says that he will not give you more than you can bear. So God has in mind how broad your shoulders are. God has in mind how much you are able to sustain. God has in mind your spiritual threshold. God has in mind your capacity. God has in mind your potential. And guess what? Your capacity, your potential that God sees in you is beyond your imagination. God sees things in you that you don't even see in yourself. But he sees fit to bring about the trials and the tribulations, the hardships, the rebuke, the discipline, the correction, the instruction in order that he might achieve the work that he started in us. The book of Hebrews also says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, sitting at the right hand of the throne of God. He's saying Jesus also endured hardship. Jesus also endured rebuke. Why? Because he was a sinful man? No, absolutely not. Why? Because he had some areas of his life that he had to undergo a heart transplant? No, absolutely not. God's heart was pure. It was so pure that he decided to take your place and mine on the cross at Calvary, considering it a joy, facing rebuke, correction, discipline, and punishment for the betterment of others. What am I trying to say here? When God disciplines your life, it's because he loves you and he loves your family. It's because he loves your friends. It's because he loves everybody that's in your sphere of influence. Are you a boss? Do you have influence? Well, guess what? There's more hardship on the way. Why? Because he loves you. And because God is going to enrich your life and cause you to, to grow in wisdom, to cause you to grow in strength, to cause you to grow in perseverance, hupomone. That's how much God loves you. And in doing so, he increases your faith. He increases your strength. He increases the depth of your faith and your trust and your commitment to him. Why? Because he's entrusted you with all of these hardships, knowing that you're going to drop to your knees. You're going to fall on your face like Moses did before the Lord, and you're going to lean into God. That's why he's bringing hardship into your life. God's not smiling. He's not happy when, when he has to chastise us or rebuke us. No, it hurts him. Just like a father or mother hates to discipline their child, but they know that they have to. They don't want to be willing parties to their grave. Neither does God want to be a willing party to yours. Maybe the word that I'm giving tonight is for your brother. Maybe the word of God that I'm bringing tonight is for your sister. Maybe it's for a loved one or a friend. Maybe they need to hear this word of discipline, love, correction, instruction, and chastisement that God has for his children. It's because God has a desired outcome that he wants to bring about in your life and in mine. That's how much he loves us. It's amazing. So don't go, woe is me. Don't, don't go, why God? Why me, God? No, say, okay, God. Let's do this together. Teach me. What do I need to learn? Verse seven says, endure hardship as discipline. For God is treating you as a son. God is treating you with the same amount of love and respect that a father has for his children. Imagine, 
And an illegitimate child is not treated the same way that a true son or daughter is by their father or their mother. Moreover, verse 9, if we all had human fathers who disciplined us and, and we respected them for it, how much more should we submit to the father of our spirits and live? In other words, submit to the discipline that God is bringing into our lives, the correction. <laughs> All right, so <laughs> you're not going to like this one so much. How many of you are married? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Go ahead and put up a little high five sign right there in the comments. How many of you are married? Go ahead. Go ahead. Come on. Y'all know where that button is. If you ain't married, don't worry. I got some for you next. So watch this. And don't tell Boomi I said this. She probably ain't even listening or paying attention right now. She's probably dealing with Lola. God teaches me and corrects me and disciplines me the most through her, through my wife. And oh my Lord, it is the worst thing to have to accept. It is the worst thing to have to acknowledge when God uses my wife to discipline me. Because oftentimes it's the words that God puts in her mouth or in her heart that are coming from a place of love that have to bring me back in line and correct me when I'm wrong or out of line. Don't tell her I said that. I don't like to give her the, the, the benefit of the doubt too much. <laughs> I got too much pride. All right, y'all don't tell Sister Boomy I said that, all right? So, <laughs> but watch this. Coming back to that idea of why God disciplines us. God wants to benefit the lives of those around you. Oh man, I can't get over that. I can't get over that, that truth. And God loves us so much that he disciplines us so that others would benefit from the fruit of our lives. In other words, God's, God's going to do an amazing work in your life as soon as you begin to submit to God's work in your life. And how, does, how do you know when it's God that's correcting? How do you know when it's God who's disciplining you? How do you know when it's God that is bringing about these, these trials and tribulations and it's not just some coincidence and it's not just some, uh, <coughs> some random situation? Well, when you submit to the Holy Spirit, He will heighten your conviction level. And through the Word of God, God will begin to teach you, reveal to you, and instruct you you in the ways of his disciplines for your life. Straight up. The Holy Spirit convicts you. He convicts you when you're all by yourself. You don't got to tell a soul. You don't even have to confess that to your family, to your best friend. You don't have to, you don't have to confess that to your spouse. You don't have to confess that to your fiance. You don't even have to confess it to your children. It could be something that it's just between you and God. And you know he is bringing about a refined gold and bringing you through the fire. He's bringing you through the refiner's fire. You don't have to admit it to anybody unless you want to. If you do, man, I admire your integrity. I admire your, your, your candor. I admire your, your guts and your strength and your humility. If you can, acknowledge these things and tell your, your special somebody or your best friend um, what God's doing in your life. But guess what, man? When God is speaking to your heart, open your heart, open your life, open your, open your mind. Let God speak straight into your heart and straight into your life. You know, but when God loves you like a child, when God loves you like his son, when God loves you like a daughter, it's a love that you can't compare. It's like today I was at my parents' house we um we're in a uh, we have an understanding a COVID nineteen understanding. Every, uh, there's two families right now that are able to interact with our our families, and we've been we've been out of uh, public spheres, and so it's it's been safe to be around um, mom and dad. All right, don't judge us for it, um, but I had to take care of some significant uh, family business today. Um, <clears throat> but I was with my my mom and dad, and I didn't want to impose on my parents. Um, and so when my wife and kids had to go home, 
I said, you can go home and uh, take the car and I'll take an Uber. I don't even know if Uber is still working or, or what. And my, my mom, my dad actually looked over at me and he said, are you serious? And I was like, what? My, my dad was like, don't you ever insult me again by, by trying to say you'll, you'll take any other means of transportation other than me or your mom giving you a ride home. And I'm like, man, I'm 41. My dad, my mom and dad pops is, uh, 70 mom is 68. And, and I didn't want to impose on them. I'm, I'm a grown man. I mean, I'm 41 years old. You know, I'm a grown man. And my pops was just like, son, you'll always be my son. You just say the word and we'll jump in my yellow Porsche convertible and take a cruise. <laughs> I'm, I'm messing. We didn't go in the convertible today. But, and I said, I'm sorry, dad. He said, it's okay, son. Don't ever insult me again like that. I have to give you a cachetada with my good, my left hand. Boom, boom. So anyways, I got a cachet, cachetada from my, from my, uh, my pops. If you don't know what a cachetada is, a cachetada is like um, a, a slap to the cheek. Cachetón is, is the cheeks. For those of you though, that don't know Spanish, these are your cachetones, all right? These are your cachetones right here. So a cachetada is like a boom, it's a, it's a backhand, it's a, a psh, all right? So you can go ahead and give me a, a backhand slap right there on your comments below. But, but watch this. You want to know who doesn't discipline like a father or a mother? Like an uncle or a grandparent? No, I'm serious. I'm serious. Uncles and aunties sweeten and fatten up your kids and then they send them home to you to do all the hard stuff because they want to enjoy all the benefits of being an uncle, an auntie, or a grandparent with not having to do the real work, with not having to do the hard stuff. They get to just send them right back on to mom and dad's house to let you do all the spanking, all the disciplining, to say all the no's. Well, that's why my kids want to go to grandma and grandpa's house all the time. Because that's where they get all the candy, all the snacks, all the sweets. Oh, Mama Kathy, you know what I'm talking about, Mama Kathy. I know you be spoiling your, your grandbabies. Oh, I know you do. At my, my, my mom and dad's house, they got a hostess Twinkie cabinet. They got hostess uh, Ding Dong cabinet. They got a candy cabinet and drawer. Man, they got a drawer that's just high enough for my three-year-old daughter Lola to access so she can get candy whenever she wants. But then they send them home to us and send us the dentist bill. Well, next time I'm sending the dentist bill to my mom and dad. Better believe it. Shoot. Uncles and aunties, grandmas and grandpas sweetening them up, fattening them up, sending them to us so that we have to put them back in line again and give them the necessary discipline and medicine that they need. Why? It's going to be your fault next time they're shedding out a tear when they say, uh, Grandma and Grandpa give us everything that we want. Can we just go and live with them now? Yeah. But anyway, enough of that rant. All right. So what do you do Oh, I see my mom. I see my I see my mom. Yeah, I see you. Thank you, mom, for brushing their teeth. Okay, so watch this. Auntie Diane, I know you're a good mommy. You're a good mommy to Savannah. God bless you. But so so watch this. How do we respond when we do in fact know that God is the one who's dis bringing discipline to you? How do you respond when you know that the conviction that you're feeling in your heart, that you're experiencing in your spirit is straight from God? for your benefit and for the benefit of those around you and the kingdom of God. Because we're a part of the kingdom of God. We are part of the body of Christ. So when you undergo the necessary discipline, all right, um, and the heart transplant that God wants to do in you, then the, the body of Christ is also um, beneficiaries to the work that God is doing in your life. Oh man, that's, that's deep right there. That's heavy. That's heavy. So when God chastises you, I benefit from the discipline that you're undergoing in your life. But far be it from me to ever judge you in your situation and ever tell you, this is God correcting you. This is God rebuking you. This is God disciplining you. I will never say that to you. I will never come into your house, come into your life and tell you that God is bringing about discipline in your life. No, that is for you to discern. That is for me to simply 
support you in and pray for you while God puts you on the altar of sacrifice. While God places you on the operating table and begins to do the heart transplant in your life. I mean, you think about that for a moment. Just, 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 just hunker down right there for a moment. God wants to do that work in your life. He's going to bring about the greater good. Bible says in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. I think of people like Moses, whom God disciplined and chastised, but whom God was using for a greater potential, a greater, a greater moment. And God knew that he had to prune some areas and some things in Moses' life. So he took him into the, the wilderness way before he brought the children of Israel back into the wilderness with Moses. God had to show Moses the way first before Moses could lead his people out of Egypt and into the will and promises of God. What about Joseph? God had to allow Mo, uh, Joseph to experience chastisement, discipline, hardship, okay? Time and time again, sold into slavery by his brothers, deception by his brothers, telling his father that he had died. Then, having been lied upon because he resisted temptation in Potiphar's wife, trying to seduce him, he was thrown in prison. And rather than make a mockery of Potiphar's wife, his own wife, what did he do? He had to protect his wife's word and he had to cast Joseph as far as he could away from his estate. And then finally, God brought Joseph into the great graces of Pharaoh, where God elevated Pharaoh for the greater good of the people of God. So what does God want to do when he brings about discipline in your life if it isn't so that God can bring a greater harvest of righteousness for your life? Hebrews chapter 12 says, our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for good, for our good, that we may share in his holiness. No discipline ever seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Scripture says, train up a child in the way that he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. How should you respond? How should I respond? Number one, acknowledge our wrong. Number two, repent and say, I'm sorry. Number three, pray about your necessary response or behavioral change. And then change the behavior. Change the approach, change your mentality, change your attitude, change your heart on that matter. And God will speak clearly to you on the matter. And last thing, number four, commit it to the Lord and to others around you. And God will bring forth the fruit and the harvest of righteousness in your life. Praise the Lord. I tell you what, I am waiting for the day when my children say, Mom, Dad, thank you for the discipline that you brought to our lives. It still hasn't come yet. <laughs> I don't think they appreciate discipline and correction quite yet. They don't understand it completely. Um, our oldest, our 13-year-old, he's coming around and he understands it. He's a good boy. Our middle son uh, is learning. He's learning. He's in process. Just put it that way. And our youngest, the three-year-old princess, she is um, has no concept <laughs> of discipline, correction, or what it's for and why we have to do it. But she's learning a little bit at a time as we are able to bring her into that understanding and discernment. Uh, so much so that one day, prayerfully, 
she'll be able to recognize that it was the love of her parents um, that had to discipline her in her uh, young years. And it's the love that God has for each and every one of you um, and me that he continues to allow us to experience hardship, trial, discipline, correction, um, rebuke, and instruction. I pray that we welcome discipline. I pray that we welcome instruction. I pray that we embrace hardship. Don't welcome it. I pray that we embrace uh, the changes that God wants to bring um, in our lives. Um, the chastisement, I wouldn't say embrace, but accept it because it's for your good. And God wants to see a greater result in your life and in mine. If you're joining us tonight for the very first time and you've been tracking along with us in God's word, understanding that Jesus bore the consequences and took on the punishment for the sin of the world. That means you and me, that in the midst of our transgressions, we were made um, guilty because we have been at odds with God. Father God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for your sins and mine. And for that very reason, we have been restored into a loving relationship with our father. That it's through the love of the son and the chastisement that he bore on Calvary. And Calvary is that hill that we speak about so frequently and so often as Christians. The hill where Jesus um, was placed. He was lifted up um, above, above all men so that all men would be drawn unto him. The Bible says that he who knew no sin became sin so that the people of God might become the righteousness of God. And because Jesus became that very sin and he took on that chastisement and discipline, for on your behalf and mine, we can have eternal life and we can have our sins forgiven. If you're with us tonight for the very first time and you'd like to invite Jesus to come into your life, I'd like to lead you in a prayer right now. And those who are still on the line can pray um, with us as well as we pray for those who still have not yet received salvation. I'd like to encourage you to invite your friends and family to join us this Sunday morning at 10.30 a.m., our English services, um, our very own Pastor Kevin Nickerson, our youth pastor and chaplain for your Los Angeles Rams, will be bringing a word from the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 10 th uh, 7 through 10. Um, our weakness um, makes us strong in Jesus Christ, our Lord. But... Um, if you are inviting Jesus to come into your heart tonight, I'd like to lead you in a prayer um, right now. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your tender mercies, which are new every morning. Father, it's your love for us that, um, that keeps us and holds us and allows us, Father God, to be in relationship um, with God. Um, with our God, with our Lord. And, and so we simply say thank you. Lord, we ask that you forgive us for our sins. For we know, Lord, that we fail you every day. We've all fallen short of the glory of God, but it's your gift of grace that offers salvation to him or her who believes. So Father, if there's anybody who is listening tonight that has invited Jesus to come into their life and has accepted his work on the cross of Calvary, that Jesus paid the ultimate penalty of sin and gave his life as a sacrifice for the world that he or she would receive eternal life right now. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, that 
He died on the third day and rose from the dead. Then he shall be saved. If that's you tonight, if you've invited Jesus to come into your life, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart how much he's done and all that he's done for you, then you can, in fact, um, be certain beyond a shadow of a doubt, um, beginning by a seed of faith that was planted in your heart tonight, a seed that God will continue to, to grow, a seed that the Holy Spirit will continue to water through the word of God, through worship, through prayer and service and obedience to our God, God will see to it that he will harvest the fruit of your life, the fruit of your obedience and your commitment to him. Mission Ebenezer Family Church, I love you. I miss you with all of my heart. Bumi and I cannot wait to be back in fellowship with you. I don't know what fellowship is going to look like in the coming weeks, we don't know what services are going to look like. We don't know if we're going to have to do six to eight one hour services throughout uh, Sunday morning. We don't know how we're going to be able to congregate or space ourselves out in the sanctuary. If there's going to be any uh, limitations or maximum occupancy uh, rules or mandates um, by the state or our local city officials. But. Regardless of the situation, though we are in exile now, though we find ourselves in a time of mourning, remember that tomorrow God's mercies are new. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. God bless you, church. I can't wait to put my big arms around you and give you a warm embrace in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you.